Now let us begin with the very first panel of the day, which is having the theme as transforming Indian workspaces through technology. As the name suggests, it is going to be a very fruitful, very informative session. As I take the name, I request all the dignitaries or the guests to kindly make uh, their way towards the stage so that we can start with the panel. All right, so can we have Ms. Selza Venkit Ariel, EVP Global CHRO and India Country Head, INSEDO INC. Can we all put our hands together for Ms. Selja? Can we also have Mr. Paral Sharma, Head HRBP, Hero Motor Corp. We would also have Ms. Jayita Roy, VP HR, the ADECO Group. Can we have you here on the stage, ma'am? We would also have Mr. Neeraj Mehra, VP HR, Infogain. Everyone, please give him a big hand. Shall we have Mr. Archit Jauri, BH Personal Collaboration, Polly? Can we have you here on the stage, sir? Everybody, please give them a big hand. Last but not the least, we have the moderator as Ms. Radhika Arora, VP and Group CHRO, Jackson Group. Can we all give her a big hand, ladies and gentlemen? Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to observe now. And uh, I think uh, with the context being set, let's straight away um, get into the discussion. Uh, I think, yes, uh, digital transformation is the need of the hour and the businesses which really don't keep up pace and if they don't present the tech forward strategy may definitely fall behind competition. And this sense of urgency, you know, around this digital transformation essentially has been fueled by unprecedented times presented to all of us uh, by COVID-19. And this VUCA world in which we operate in, I think we have no choice but to adopt technology. IT is far, far ahead, but uh, companies like ours who are into manufacturing, construction, infra, we also have no choice but to adopt technology, but to adopt uh, this hybrid workforce. So, um, if we really look around, you know, 90% of, uh, of the organizations in India are either implementing a digital transformation or they are trying to work on a digital strategy. But um, if all of the HR heads sitting here, if we really put our hands on our hearts, are we sure we are totally successful here? <laughs> so uh, I think as the famous quote goes, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. You know, we can have the best technology available. We can have a wonderful strategy to execute that transformation. But at the end of the day, what drives, is, uh, drives the whole agenda is actually the people and the culture of the organization. So is it all set, see, uh, with COVID-19 and, you know, there was this uh, uh, hyper automation happening, everything happening at a fast speed and uh, we had no option but to work from home and all of that. But at the end of the day, now we all of us are realizing that there are some flip sides to perpetually working from home and we are calling people back. So ultimately, we have to see where is the blend happening. We have to definitely adapt and adopt the new technology as Charles Darwin says, the species which really survives is not the strongest one. It's not even the most intellectual one. But the species that survive are the ones who are best able to adapt and adopt the environments they are put in. On that note, I would uh, want some inputs from our esteemed panel here on how we are really adapting to this new age technology. So I think uh, we'll go in this order, Neeraj, by chance we are sitting like this. So I'll start with the first question where I would want to know in your organization, how you are really uh, adopting this new age technology uh, to address the need of uh, this digitized workforce post COVID times. Over to you, Neeraj. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Neeraj Mehra. I represent Infogain. Uh, we are an IT services company, 6,000 people. Uh, I think personally, I love technology. Uh, technology has been of great help for us as an organization. Uh, if, you, if I share my journey with Infogain, uh, in the last two years, we have, in the last four years, we have acquired four organizations, two during the COVID times, and uh, we have done the cultural integration, we have done the 
process, policy, integration as well. So technology has been of uh, great use to us. Uh, just before COVID uh, came our way, uh, we had launched, we had taken a product called Workplace. If any of you have heard of, heard of Workplace, which is a Facebook product. Uh, it was a blessing in disguise for us because that was the only way to communicate. Uh, where, you know, we used Workplace to communicate, to do our events, to do our engagement. Uh, you know, we have heavily started using Microsoft Teams, which is again technology for us to do interviews. Uh, our, our entire process of interviews, our entire onboarding, offboarding process is all digital. Uh, I think, you know, when I, when, you, when I started my career 20 years back, I used to think that why does my CEO has to travel to India just to do a town hall? Why can't this happen through technology, right? And uh, I'm happy that, you know, now the CEO doesn't need to travel, right? It is not just about money, but, you know, we have been doing, we have consistently been doing town halls through Zoom, through teams and it has been of great help, you know, connecting with everybody. I used to also dream some years back that why can't I connect with people across India and do a cultural event, right? Thanks to COVID, I do all my events now, culture, uh, all online events, right? What has also helped during the COVID times is our ability to uh, not just interact with the employees, but with their families as well, uh, right? So we are more closer to our family, more closer to our people because we can see uh, their kids, we can see their families. Uh, so I think that these are these are few of the things that we did in terms of uh, you know shifting from the physical world towards the technology, and you know technology has really helped us to scale up. Uh, interestingly, you know our engagement scores have increased in the last two years. We became a great place to work with two acquisitions, with 30% attrition. So. Right in the last two years, everybody knows in the technology world that in the last two years have been very, very challenging. So you can imagine how the technology has really helped us to remain connected to our people, despite of two acquisitions, despite of 30% retrition, which has come down drastically now. Uh, so technology has been a great savior, right? And it has really helped us to stay connected. Wonderful. Uh, thanks, uh, Neeraj. Let me shift my conversation to now from technology to somebody in the manufacturing space. Uh, Parul, uh, since you are from Hero and uh, it's a manufacturing setup, I would uh, want to understand from you, you know, how you are using these uh, uh, new age technologies, uh, you know, these virtual screening, AI, data analytics, hyper automation and all of this at your workplace to really, uh, you know, build efficient teams. Great question, Radhika. Uh, first of all, a very good morning to all of you. I loved Mr. Gupta's conversation essentially on the lines of how you build capability. And the reason why I was smiling so much is because Neeraj, while you have a 30% attrition, we at manufacturing are barely around 20. So if you need some inputs, I'm, I'm the person. And I know Radhika is as well. Um, having said that... We are, we are already down to 18. Lovely, <laughs> lovely. We'll exchange notes. Uh, we had a huge, lovely uh, conversation, essentially, thanks to the Observe Now team. We started a bit late, but uh, while we were outside, we were essentially engaging in the use of HR and HR technology and how it can help deploy teams, businesses, uh, and uh, organizations of repute like ours work better, faster, efficiently. Um, one of the things that we realize is the fact that it is the growth mindset. It is the change that needs to happen in people and not the technology. So that's, that's one thing that we learned during our COVID experience. The second thing that we learned is we need to deploy technology which is suited to our stage of evolution, which means while we can have the technology that helps move a caterpillar into a butterfly, but if HR transformation done wrong, will essentially translate a caterpillar to a really fast caterpillar, and it doesn't help anyway. At Hero Motor Corp, there's a reason why we are world's number one two-wheeler manufacturing organization 22 years in a row. The reason why we've been able to do that is because of the fact that we run our vision on something which is called as deploying frictionless employee experience. So anything and everything that we do is on the parameters of how is it that we personalize our people tools and technologies, how do we customize our people tools and technologies, how do we make it more intuitive, how do we make sure that the people who work with us, the teams who work with us are in a tune of making understanding 
and believing our brand ethos and the value system. So if you are locked into the thought of what we build and that is to be the future of mobility, we are halfway done. So engagement, like how Neeraj mentioned, is something that we work towards. The people experience, the people X program that we have has seven work streams and those are the tools, and I'm coming back to Radhika's uh, question now, are the tools that we work towards. So the seven work streams are project H2O, which is higher to offboarding. So we are working with a consulting partner to help us understand what are those gaps that we have in processes. We use manual processes. We use non-value added activities for us to be able to deploy. So that's number one, project H2O. Project Moonshot is on the kind of employer of choice that we intend to become. So to tell our hero story, which is the Hero Motor Corp website, uh, there is a huge transformation uh, about the fact that you know, we need to tell the story to the world. If we don't communicate, we don't communicate well. How will people know? How will they be a tribe for our intention to deploy mobility across? The third is Project Thrive, which is visitor pass management on expense management, etc. Very closely working with a couple of people tools. So if, you, if you're interested, we can talk more about it later. Uh, the fourth essentially is the main focus of how our hero verse is going to be, which is hero one, which is the intranet. Now the intranet typically in organizations like all of ours will typically just be a communication tool where it's a one way communication here at hero. What we are doing is whether it is people communication or business communication, there is a conscious intent for an employee to definitely log on to the internet to hear about the story, build a social connection, ensure they share thoughts, ideas, get any query by the use of AI chatbot. Um, there is a huge focus on people analytics. So the, the, the tool that we deploy essentially will help us understand what are what are the areas that our people are learning? What are the things that they are reading? What are the chats that they are converging on? Uh, the other area is in, in line of Project Slingshot. And while there are organizations that use uh, uh, you know, Facebook at work uh, or uh, uh, Teams, uh, we use Google Space. So the usage of Google Workspace and the adoption typically is something that our keen focus is. Um, by default, the CIO was COVID until two years ago, and because of the fact that there was COVID, every, ev everything moved virtually. So hence, we would intentionally want our people to use um, collaboration tools and technologies. Lastly, um, the reason why we can communicate and collaborate better by using people tools is something that we've built in on our ecosystem. So I'm not talking about people here, people who work with us, but the whole ecosystem that works with us. We are the uh, industry first two-wheeler organization to launch Hero Connected, which is a website exclusively for our dealer partners. What this means is my dealer doesn't need to call up a territory sales manager or area manager or a zonal head. What they will just need to do is log on to the website and see what the news are, whether it is on working capital management or whether it is on some incentive schemes that they are bringing in. So really interesting things, really interesting projects we are doing. Uh, if there are questions, we could probably uh, you know, take that up. Thank you so much for the question, Radhika. Thank you. Thanks so much for this wonderful insight on what you guys are doing, some amazing work at Hero Motor Corp. Um, moving ahead with this discussion, uh, Joyta, uh, my next question would be to you. Can you give us one or two specific examples on how really uh, technology has helped you solve a business problem or you know, employee retention and engagement thing? You know? Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I'm Joyita Roy. I head the HR for the Edeco Group in India. So we are an end-to-end -end HR solutions company. So globally, we have invested uh, greatly into digital innovation uh, that helps us to serve our clients better and also internally enhance the employee experience. Uh, to answer your questions on the business growth, business problems, and also employee engagement, I'll take it in two parts. Uh, the first one uh, being the business growth or the business agenda that we help or we try to strive through the technology implementation. Um, let me start with uh, being an HR, I'll start with the performance management of how we do that. That's my favorite uh, of all the uh, sub-functions that we do with. 
Now, Paul, I'm sure like many of you, we have uh, also technology, the tools that help us to cascade goals. But what we have done differently that really helps us is to have a blended approach. And I'm sure all of us would agree that technology cannot solve uh, all problems, right? We definitely need to have the human minds to uh, decide what we really need to drive within the organization. So this year specifically, I can give you an example of once we have decided at a leadership level that what kind of culture, what kind of behaviors, what kind of business goals that we need to drive for 2023 and also beyond, uh, our tool, we customized it. Now what it means that by that is that we have created very business specific roles, at least two goals that we want to the last individual in the organization to achieve and to drive. Now, what, how it happens today when an employee opens the performance management tool, so we have five goals uh, that, that we kind of uh, drive. Now, out of those five goals, the first two goals are pre-populated with the weightage for, and depending on the role, to the last individual in the organization that we wanted to drive. So technology has definitely helped to bring in that customization. So an employee cannot change or cannot edit those two goals. What they can do is, of course, depending on the discussion they have with their managers to work on the other three goals. So that's like the first how we have used the technology to drive the, the behaviors or at least some of the couple of the goals that we really wanted each of our organizers, each of our employees to exhibit. The second, which was also more of a challenge because of COVID, um, we had uh, a, quite a struggle to get our people back to work. And that's what it also led to a situation wherein uh, we got a lot of feedback and we ourselves realized that the connect between the manager and employee started to dip heavily. And as a result, uh, we had a lot of situation wherein employee came back and said, like last year, our managers never had a discussion with us on what we need to do. I mean, it's a very basic problem, uh, but then that was the reality. Uh, the third, uh, the second point was that, oh, I do not know this goal was given to me. It was not been discussed. It's there, just there in my uh, PDA or the you know, performance management uh, tool that we had. Now, this is where we, what we have done, again, customizing the tool uh, is uh, when an employee is submitting or after entering the goals, there is a mandatory tick options wherein the employee have to say whether there was a one-on-one -on -one, uh, discussion that has happened with the manager. And third, what we use the tool for, especially on the performance management part, employees are given an option to acknowledge. And actually, it's not even an option, option it's a mandatory uh, st uh, step for them to move forward. So this is how we are using technology to drive the culture that we wanted to drive uh, with a blended approach of one-on-one -on -one, uh, discussion with the managers uh, that we needed to do. Second, uh, we also have created a lot of, um, I would say, uh, no code tools to low code tools to AI embedded technologies, which gives us real time metrics, uh, real time uh, insights to the organization's the drivers, the financial drivers that we wanted to achieve, which helps us to focus and refocus on how we do that. Now, with uh, your question on employee engagement, again, I'm sure this would be a practice of many companies. We have a technology through which we do dipsticks uh, for all our employees. Now, through those technological analysis, those dipstick analysis, we have uh, figured out that uh, this year we would like to focus on employee well-being and also the learning, uh, creating a learning culture. Now, for employee um, well-being, uh, we have uh, created a app, uh, which is like a 24 bar 7 uh, app, and we have also partnered with some of the one of the industry uh, experts in that, wherein uh, we are able to offer. Um, like as I said, 24 bar seven uh, access to mental counselors, um, coaches, uh, various, and we also then do a lot of human connect exclusive webinars. Just to give an example, just uh, a few weeks ago, we did a exclusive uh, webinar, which was like one person coming and talking is about mindful eating. Uh, from a learning perspective, uh, we have, uh, again, a technology platform, which we call as the Edeco Group University. Uh, we um, call it as a Tag U, uh, which offers, again, 24 bar 7 learning opportunities, bite-sized training programs, self-paced learning programs. But again, uh, we realize there is a need to have human touch uh, into this process. So we have been, uh, so all our leaders at the India leadership team, they spend every, hour, every month at least an hour, we call it as a learning hour, wherein they come, 
use that technology platform, but have a discussion. It's more like the employees get to hear directly from the uh, leadership team. We have also made it kind of a mandatory for all our people managers to have people connect sessions at least certain hours and how we drive those kind of a behavior again through technology. Uh, first time managers is again one of our critical areas that we are looking at. So beyond the technology, we have um, various learning community wherein all first time managers come together and then they discuss uh, their learnings and challenges and opportunities. Um, to answer your question, long answer, uh, we use a blended approach from a technology point of view uh, and that's how uh, we, it is working for us and that's how we are uh, moving ahead with. Thank you. Thanks, Joyita. I think uh, you've made a very interesting point here. We were having this discussion, you know, before the panel also uh, outside. Uh, at the end of the day, there's a lot of talk about uh, digitalization, hyper automation, technology. But the flip side to this whole thing is actually the, lo uh, the lost human touch which all of us uh, really are missing. So I would want to, um, you know, deliberate on this point further. Uh, I think, uh, Shailja, if you can throw some light on this, how you are ensuring that, yes, we are adapting to technology, at the same time not losing that human connect in your organization. Yeah? Thank you so much. Um, so, yes, um, I think that during COVID, um, and, you know, when everybody was geographically dispersed and you know, kind of across, you know, multiple cities and countries, etc. We went to the other extreme and we implemented every possible tool which we could lay our hands on, whether it was for engagement, whether it was learning, digitized all our trainings, implemented chatbots and so on. So having gone to the other extreme, we over a period of time started realizing that we had to come back somewhere in between uh, because yes, we had absolutely lost the human touch. And, and some of it was very simple in terms of when we were looking at, you know, kind of just the attrition conversations. What we realized was just in terms of, if you want to look at data, the legacy employees, people who stayed with us and continued to thrive and grow, were people who knew in zero, who who understood our values, who understood what behaviors they needed to demonstrate to succeed. And, and the people that we lost very, very quickly were individuals who were, I would say, less than 20 months tenure with the firm. And what typically would happen is the engagement with them, with them would be, you know, you know, we'd bring them, we'll onboard them, we'd make them a part of the team, et cetera. But it could just be a small trigger which could kind of, you know, drive an attrition, you know, decision. And that's the time that we realized that we needed to anchor people more to the organization. So starting from the onboarding part of the process, uh, where that's the place where we started bringing people back into the organization, and we started kind of building the entire culture of how do you harmonize them with Encido, how do you get them to feel better, how do you get them to feel the, the human touch across you know, different geographies, whether it was Mexico or US or India, that's one part. Second part, in terms of a, a simple problem statement, I would say is in technology, when we were looking at engagements, client engagements or client projects, everybody would come in with a Accenture way or an HP way or, you know, um, you know kind of a Cisco or a VMware way of, of addressing that particular problem statement or a situation. And, and there would be some amount of friction in terms of just the project execution. So the in zero way was getting lost somewhere in the way we looked at SOP, so we fundamentally went after problem statements. So driving the entire mindset from give me instructions and I will do next to actually being skeptical and saying, why are we using this line of code? There's actually a better way of doing it. We wanted people to go to that extent. And first and foremost, understanding how to problem solve effectively. And second is learning from SMEs. That comes from an apprenticeship model and it cannot be, you know, kind of almost symbiotically learned through a virtual environment. So that's where we started coming back into this coaching, mentoring, 
learning by observation with SMEs. And that's kind of become the important part of it. You know, so, so these are aspects where, um, you know, I think that the human touch is most important. The last part that I would talk about, and because there are numerous examples around this, but the last part that I would absolutely want to touch, up, touch upon is, you know, this is the Embrace Equity Week. And um, we're running an Embrace Equity series. And it's not just, you know, women, it's men, all manner of diversity where we are bringing people in. And we're having, you know, dialogues and learning sessions. And, you know, kind of, we did it last year as well, frankly. And a lot of people would log in, listen, and go away. But the richness of the conversation which is happening now, where people are getting up and saying, I've just come back from maternity, or how do I ask for a better assignment, you know, and, and what do I need to do next? And I'm worried that if I go on maternity leave, I will lose my positioning in a promotion ladder. Those are conversations we lost. And I think that's where the human factor really starts coming in. Thank you. Thank you, Shalja. I'm glad that you touched the DEI perspective here. I think no conversation or no panel discussion is complete unless uh, we touch diversity. I will come to this point later. Uh, but one question to you, Archit, since we have moved on now from technology uh, to the heart of the company, which is people and culture, uh, could you throw some light on uh, what is most important for employees to remain happy, motivated, and productive in companies? And of course, with technology in the background. So uh, thank you for that. My name is Archit Johari. I am from Poly. We are an HP company now, and we are in the business of um, helping organizations to, uh, develop a, to develop a hybrid culture. So while all of you were speaking, I was making my notes. And uh, as uh, I think um, uh, Parul said, that uh, most of the organizations are in uh, different stages of thinking about hybrid or implementing hybrid. Some are in advanced stages. Some are thinking, and some are thinking hybrid is just a fad we will go back to our old ways of uh, uh, working. So uh, what we observe in the business is that a lot of leaders are talking about technology, tools, softwares. What is missing is the people part of it. So uh, once again, when Parul said that personalization of services according to the people that resonated with me, because I feel that is the missing part and that is where people problems also come into picture. So what problems do we hear, right? We are a tech company. But um, people say that the tools which my organization has given me is not matching with my work style, right? Very simple example. Um, somebody is a salesperson. He will say, I'm a salesperson, but my calls have increased, right? As you, as you said, they, they need to have a call with the manager. So my calls have increased. I'm a salesperson. They have given me a headset which is wired. So when do I go on the field and when do I, uh, you know, connect to my, uh, to my customers? So uh, uh, there are health problems also which people come, uh, come to us and say, you know, I am, uh, uh, my calling has increased. Earlier it used to be 9 to 4, now 9 to 9, and there is no end to the uh, hours of calling. So am I supposed to be tied to the laptop whole day? So people are coming up with health problems, cervical problems, spondylitis problems. So that is what we hear from the problem side. And as a technology company, we need to give solution to the IT team, to the HR team to solve these problems using device technology. What are the solutions could you, uh, you know, so the problem which you said, nine to nine working and the boundaries getting uh, diffused. So what is the solution to that essentially? Okay, so um, having, understanding the work style of the people is very important. And uh, when I will go through my presentation, I will explain that all organizations, 92% of the workforce can be categorized into six work styles. And each work style has a unique need of communication. Right? So if you have given uh, uh, Microsoft uh, Teams to a, a person who is not engaging, so basically you are not utilizing the consumption of that device. So, so we have a device solution for each of the work style, which I will talk more once I go through my presentation, and that will give you a good idea of what I'm going to do. Thanks. Thanks, Archit. And uh, I think we still have time, and probably we can deliberate on one more question since you touched upon diversity. Um, could any one of you, you know, you can answer and uh, others can add, how are you uh, really leveraging technology for learning, collaboration, driving the diversity agenda in the organization? You know, any specific example of how we are really leveraging technology to do all this? 
So as I mentioned about this uh, learning communities that we create, so we definitely have uh, uh, the technology that gives us those insights of uh, how many, like I, I'm very proud to say uh, that we have 51% uh, women uh, mm. uh, workforce in the organization and uh, in the leadership level we have 31% uh, women leaders uh, at the country level. Uh, but is that all? Uh, when we said diversity, of course, gender equity and gender uh, parity is one part of it, but then there are so many other angles of the diversity, DEI that we... So you, we use those kind of technologies to get those insights. Uh, we have started looking at various um, uh, levels within the organizations wherein we can uh, uh, really bring in more, uh, I would say, the learning programs, awareness sessions that can really help, and it was very interesting. Um, and it is first time in my career that has happened. I was just uh, in a business review and I saw 40% uh, male and 60% women. So for the first time I was discussing with my business leader how do we bring in gender equity there. So that was very nice. So to answer your question, um, so we have uh, those learning communities. So we have also a forum called uh, She For Her, uh, wherein all uh, women employees at various levels they come in. And those, how we decide who comes in and what kind of, uh, you know, topics that we take up, what, what kind of the need of those women employees that we wanted to talk, it those comes through those kind of insights that we get through those various uh, reports, analytics that we have come in. So this is how we are looking at it. And uh, for me, as I said, this is the first time I'm in a staffing industry and it has been great insight to say that I'm not only looking at women, I'm also looking at my main uh, men population of how I can bring in more learning community to help them as well. Thank you. Shalja, please. Yeah, ask so I, I would talk about it more at a program level. So there are two parts to it. So first is that, you know, we're, we're actually very seriously looking at, um, you know, kind of the pod structure, which is a social network. And where, for example, there is a program called ACES. And ACES, is, you know, it's again, it, it kind of, it works through Yama. And, and this is the place where everybody who is a principal engineer or a technical architect, irrespective of gender, they become a part of that program. And we, we get them to start contributing and adding value uh, to projects and sharing ideas and, you know, kind of putting questions, et cetera. So that's one part. The second part um, is a program that we have called Return to Work, or it's a returnship program. In the returnship program, it has two parts to it. So one part is completely, it's a, you know, kind of, it's completely focused on um, bringing women who've taken a sabbatical or a break back to the workforce. And there, um, you know, there are certain guidelines, which is more than two years, um, you want to come back, we will train you upon some technology, you will be on an internship, and then after that, you will have to go through an assessment process to kind of get you know, kind of uh, come back into a very critical role. Then similarly, on the other hand, it's also open for men, which is where we're asking them, okay, it doesn't matter if you've taken a break for a year or so, uh, but if you want to come back to a critical position um, and just come, apply, go through the process, and we absolutely, you know, kind of want to look at you and want to kind of evaluate you on what you bring to the table. So there are a lot of those programs that we're actually running here and in US, and it is about tapping people who, for whatever reasons, may want to kind of return back, or people who want to kind of work on gigs. You know, and I think that what we've realized over a period of time is that not everybody wants to work full time, but there are people who want to work on projects and they can actually contribute beautifully. So I think that's the thing about embracing, you know, different, approaches and, and giving an opportunity or a platform for people to contribute. So I think I, w I would put it And uh, probably technology is really helping us yeah. make all this possible. Yeah, right? it's about how, to, uh, you know, we don't know where these people exist, right? Mm. So the fact is that you have to use the social media, you have to use, you know, various sites, whether it's, uh, you know, SDX Central, which is for engineers or, a, you know, GitHub and various other places where you put the word out. And, and then you get people to start applying or, you know, referring uh, people. And that's, technology has helped us reach places we could never be before. Sure, yeah. Yeah, so I think that, uh, so we are, our diversity is around 30%. Uh, 
just uh, just below 30 percent i think one of the things that we have started consciously doing is that every data every report that we see uh, there is a there is a cut which says what is the diversity right whether it is recognition whether it is performance management whether it is career progression uh, whether it is exit interview whether it is onboarding feedback everything that we see has a diversity cut to it uh, because we are extremely conscious of the fact that we need to in enhance our diversity in the organization. Uh, we are nudging our leaders, we are asking questions uh, that why is your diversity not to the level that it should be. There is a diversity goal that the CEO has taken at a board level. Uh, and diversity is not just limited to male and female diversity, right? It's about creating inclusivity with respect to uh, all the genders and all the communities uh, you know, that we live in. So I think data analytics has been of great help right, for us to go and nudge leaders that uh, why do you have this as a problem or do you have a problem of more female employees or you know, other genders moving out of your team. So I think data an analytics and technology has been of great help uh, for us. Thanks Neeraj. Uh, do you also want to and add Yes, I go after Neeraj again here. Um, some of the points that we discussed is the fact that it is not women diversity. So there is an inherent diversity and then there is an acquired diversity. The acquired diversity comes in on the basis of what education background you are, what industries you worked, what, what is your cultural acceptance, etc. cetera. The, the inherent diversity is, you know, uh, where were you born, where, which nationality are you from, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, at the end of it, yes, technology will help. We also have communities of interests like a couple of other panel members talked about. We have sensitization sessions. We have, um, we have tools which, uh, you know, our teams log into whether, uh, you know, to help understand the work situation better. But more often than not, what we have realized is we, we are making a big deal out of it. As long as there is a manager-employee relationship and both of them are empathetic towards each other for their needs, that is all that we need to take care about. At the end of it, and I'm, I'm, I'm taking a quote from, um, and I love Shailaja's, uh, you know, a hint on pushing us into diversity. Um, Verna Myers, the senior VP at Netflix, um, and, and this is the most well-known quote that she talks about, is the difference between Diversity is when you invite people to a party and inclusion is when you ask them to dance. So at the end of it, if you make it equitable and you have a sense of belongingness and you make it inclusive, that is when we are going to find joy at work. And to extend it further, if you feel that you can ask the DJ to play the song of your choice, and that's where you feel belong to the team, right? Okay, <laughs> too much on diversity. I think let's uh, shift back our discussion to technology where we started. Wonderful insights uh, from all of you, wonderful discussions. And to sum it up all, uh, where we started, right? Yes, technology is an enabler. Yes, technology helps us. Uh, COVID brought us into it too soon, which is definitely good for us. Uh, but at the end of it all, uh, there's a flip side to it, which is about people, right? So we make sure that we do a good blend so that technology becomes a real enabler and it's not just the fad for us. Technology at the end of the day should help us solve the most important problem, which is the business problem. You know, we are here to make profits. So if the technology is helping us drive that ROI, if the technology is helping us uh, get profit for the company, please do it by all means. But if it is no, take that wise choice to, uh, I will not say remain away from it, but probably uh, do it uh, the way it will help you. On that note, uh, I think I would want to wrap up this panel. Uh, unless there are any questions or any uh, suggestions from anyone in the audience. Um, we'll be happy to take the questions. Do we have uh, people from the, um, do we have questions also in the format? No, not actually, but if in case anybody wants yeah. to ask. Are we done? Okay, uh, there's uh, one hand which is going up, please. I'm sorry, <laughs> I think the format didn't have the questions, but I think we can work it out, yeah. Yes, you are. Hello, yes. 
<coughs> yeah, my name is Amit Popli and uh, I am representing Talent on Lease. As an organization, I want a question uh, to the panelist over there that uh, with regards to the technology or the other industry verticals where you guys are working, how are you handling uh, the, the balance between the hybrid, the off-site and the on-site, which is what is the requirement as of now with regards to the employees who are currently working in your organization? I think uh, most of our uh, discussions actually hinged about this point, you know, where we spoke about uh, how do we leverage technology. Uh, Joyta, you said, right, we have this acknowledgement in the end which says, did you have that enablement discussion with your manager? So it's, I think, a perfect blend of where we are using technology to do the PMS, but still we are not losing the human touch by ensuring that there's a discussion happening between employee and manager. That's one example. Uh, the, yeah. Would you like to add yeah, something? So I just want a bit of a clarification. When you say the balance, are you talking about the implementation of the hybrid program? No, I'm not talking about the implementation. I'm talking about the deliverables of an individual while working as a hybrid employee or as working on-site or working off-site because there are certain KRAs which have to be delivered. There are certain projects which have to be implemented. So how are we taking, how, how are we balancing these three parameters when yeah. we are delivering, uh, when a person okay. is delivering your, your, for that particular project? Yeah. So um, what we've done, and it may not be like the perfect uh, answer, but the fact is that what we've done is that we've realized that, you know, kind of, you know, while we've done a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday are the three days that everybody needs to be in office, but there are some some teams who have a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday kind of a thing. So we, what we've realized is that while people may do a hybrid, there will be people who will be working from home, and there could be potentially people who are working from, you know, the client location. So a couple of things. Number one is that there are decision principles around every project execution. Uh, simplest being that every project discussion or whatever it is needs to include a Zoom link, and if you're participating from a different, you know, kind of location or what have you, you have to be, you have to log in and you have to be on video. You know, there is nothing like I'm on mute and I'm not on video, that doesn't work. So it's mandatory. The second part that we have asked people to do is, there are different parts of like the kickoff or the discovery part of the process. And then there are certain, you know, like, you know, everybody goes off, does their own thing, but then they come back and then they're calibrating or they're coming up with, you know, kind of problem statements. So there are different parts or stages of the process and at different stages, whatever is deemed most critical, people have to be there in person. So you, you have to come down, you know. So what we've kind of defined is flexibilities within the project and almost like the must-haves and the must-haves are non-negotiable. So while we want to provide people flexibilities, but there are some time where we absolutely insist everybody needs to be there in the room, whether you like it or not, what you do the rest of your time is up to you. So I think those are the things that we need to, you know, we've tried to do, for example, to basically, you know, kind of accommodate different requirements, you know. I don't know if that answers your question. Thanks, Shailja. Um, how are we doing on time? Are we, uh, can we consider it as an official wrap-up? Okay, thank you, panelists. Thank you for this great discussion. And I uh, would like to request Ms. Tanya to kindly come up on the stage to felicitate everyone who spoke.